Good morning. Um, welcome here for these global health conversations. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Ana Vélez. I am a, as, an associated professor for the University of South Florida for the Department of Infectious Diseases and International Hello. Medicine. Uh, I am excited to be here with Dr. Mal Partida from Peru. Um, he is, um, next slide. Um, he is, uh, Dr. Mal Partida is um, an infectious diseases and tropical medicine uh, specialist. He is an assistant professor for the Department of Internal Medicine at the SLU Guillermo Almenara National Hospital, uh, of, uh, affiliated with the National University of San Marcos. He completed his uh, fellowship in University Peruana Cayetano Heredia. Um, he uh, also completed his, um, um, uh, he also has an interest in research in uh, tropical medicine and uh, HIV and sexual transmitted diseases. Uh, welcome, Dr. Mala Partida. Thank you for sharing with us today um, some cases in tropical medicine uh, from Peru. Um, I wanted to remind you, um, everybody, that these uh, conversations are recorded and will be posted in YouTube. Thank you and welcome, uh, Dr. Mal Partida. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Vélez. As, as Dr. Vélez said, my name is Oscar Mal Partida. I'm an infectious diseases and tropical medicine specialist. I work in Lima, Peru. So now I can start sharing my pic, my... Yes. My presentation, okay. My name is Oscar Malpartida. This is where I work, Hospital Almenara. It's the second largest hospital in Peru. It belongs to the Peruvian Social Security System, also called E Salud. It's, I'm it's sorry, a 1,000. I'm sorry, Dr. Malpartida, we don't see your presentation. Yes. Now, can you see it? No, not yet. Now. Yes. yes. I'm sorry. Um, as I was saying, I work in Hospital Almenara. This is um, a tertiary care center in it belongs to the Peruvian Social Security in Salud. It's a 1,000 bed hospital. It is a national reference center for complex medical cases. Uh, here, the Infectious Diseases Service treats mainly HIV, hospital acquired infections, surgical and immune suppressed host infections. We can also see tropical infectious diseases, but they are sporadically throughout the year. We also have a solid organ transplant department with liver, renal, and lung transplant patients and an oncohematology ward. This is the city of Lima. It's a 9 million uh, uh, inhabitant city located in the coast. Uh, 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 some data about Peru. It is located in the central part of South America in the Pacific coast. It has a surface of 1.3 million square kilometers, which is about a 13th part of the Uni United States of America surface. We have 34 million inhabitants. Our human development index, it's 0.76, which is qualified as high, <clears throat> but we have to remind you or, and remark that there's a big inequity in income between our inhabitants. Approximately 30% of our population is qualified as poor. Uh, we have three main re regions in the, or areas, geographical areas in Peru. Uh, the coast, the coastline, which contains 58% of the population, which includes the capital Lima. Uh, the Andes mountains or the highlands, 
which account for 27% of the population and the biggest area passing the Andes mountains. This is the, the jungle region or the Amazonian region, which contains 14.2% of the population. So for our first case, we have a um, 40 year old male. He comes from Huarochiri in the highlands of Lima region, not the capital city, but uh, another uh, town from, uh, from the Lima region. Like the, the state of Lima, if you would try to uh, uh, translate it <laughs> to the American geography. This is located in the highlands. It's uh, with uh, three, about 3,000 meters, uh, about 3,000 meters above sea level. Uh, he came to our council complaining of two years of hoarseness, difficulty to swallow, and a mild throat pain. Uh, he came to our council in 2021 during the COVID-19 pandemic. That is why it took that long to be referred to our center. That's why it took two years uh, before he, he, he was referred to, to our tertiary care center. Uh, as um, past medical history, he's, he had 20 years ago cutaneous leishmaniasis, which resolved spontaneously. Uh, we have to remark that 6% of cutaneous leishmaniasis in South America uh, can have a spontaneous resolution, uh, comparing to 80% of the cases of, case of old world species like Leishmania infantum or Ethiopica that can cure spontaneously in about 80% of the cases. But also 10 years ago, he had mucosal leishmaniasis with a soft palate involvement, and he was treated with IV antimonials <clears throat> in our hospital with a successful outcome. Well, this is the town of Huarochiri. It is located in a Inter-Andean Valley, uh, which means uh, between the mountains uh, um, where most of Leishmaniasis cases actually occur in Peru, the majority of cases in Lima come from Huarochiri or its surroundings. This is the, the, the capital of the city and this is the region of the, the province of Huarochiri. So this is the picture of our patient. Mm. As you can see, he has extensive soft palate involvement. Um, the mucosa is pale. As you can see, there's a loss of the uvulae, of the uvula, and a nodular appearance and some yellowish exudate on the posterior oropharynx. No? So what are your thoughts about this case? Can you hear me, right? Yes, we hear you. Okay. Yes. Well, in this case, the differential diagnosis is very narrow. Uh, the lesions are typical of mucocutaneous leishmaniasis. But in this case, we also had a concern of maybe oropharyngeal or laryngeal squamous cell carcinoma because the patient was previously affected by leishmaniasis and was treated. No? Uh, this is, um, we took a smear of the soft palate and, uh, and a biopsy was sent for culture and histopathology. This is not actually the, the, real, um, the real smear. I put it here because it's, it, it's, it's, um, it's very clear and, and has um, a lot of amastigos. Uh, so the smear was positive for um, Leishmania mastigos, which are two to three centimeter, uh, two, to, two to three micrometer <laughs> structures with a small nucleus and, um, and a basophilic structure called the kinetoplast. Here you can see the nucleus and this small dot is the kinetoplast, see? So we mainly, we usually say in the laboratory, Look for a small dot, and that's where you you will find the Leishmania mastigotes. No, the also the the lesion also came back positive. The culture came back positive. We we used the blood agar for um, 
and the culture came back positive with the mastigals of leishmaniasis. And in the laryngeal endoscopy, we observed a partial loss of the left side of the epiglottis and mild uh, vocal cord edema was seen. It is important to check for laryngeal involvement in these cases because during treatment, especially with IV antimonials, uh, a paradoxical reaction can occur and lesions may enlarge during uh, the treatment and, and it can cause airway obstruction. Uh, in that case, when there's um, um, an airway, airway compromise due to the leishmaniasis, we must treat the, the patient as an inpatient and we have to pre-treat the patient. We have to use dexamethasone for a few days before and during the first day of IV antimonials. That is what we did with this patient. Well, as I said, the diagnosis is uh, the uh, new world mucosal leishmaniasis. No? The, the difference between the new world and the old world new leishmaniasis is, is, is basic, basically because of the species um, that, that, are, that cause, cause this disease. This is the, the vector, the Lutzoma, the Lutzomia uh, sandfly. So the new world leishmaniasis in South America is mainly caused by Leishmania brasiliensis species. There are, are, there are some subspecies of, of Leishmania in Peru, like Leishmania peruviana, but mo most of the cases, cases are caused by Leishmania brasiliensis. Uh, the clinical spectrum uh, includes uh, cutaneous, mucocutaneous, or mucosal leishmaniasis. Um, in the, the, the people called the cutaneous leishmaniasis UTA here in Peru, and the mucosal leishmaniasis, they call it spundia. Yep. Unlike uh, the old world leishmaniasis, um, we do not have um, visceral involvement in our species. That is very rare. Of course, there are some cases of visceral leishmaniasis in Brazil. Um, it is thought that these uh, cases are produced by, by species that were brought by the um, Portuguese um, from Europe in the 1500s. No? Uh, leishmaniasis in Peru is endemic. It occurs mainly between 300 and 3,000 meters above sea level, where they usually, where the Lutzomia sandfly usually lives. One third of the Peruvian population are located at that altitude, so one third of the population may be at risk of acquiring uh, uh, Leishmaniasis. Uh, the Lutzomia the sandfly is a peridomestic vector, unlike uh, Anopheles, which is uh, mainly a, a rural vector. Um, as I said before, um, spontaneous healing of a lesion uh, can occur, but it does not prevent for posteriorly having mucosal leishmaniasis. And even so, when a cutaneous lesion is uh, treated, the risk of mucosal leishmaniasis afterwards is not, uh, is not diminished. That being said, if you, if you have cutaneous leishmaniasis, leishmaniasis and you treat it, you can, all, you can still have a mucosal leishmaniasis in the future. Uh, reinfection is fairly common. Uh, sometimes it is difficult to differentiate uh, reinfection from, uh, from real abscess. Um, it's an organ infection, it's an orphan infectious disease, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so funding for new diagnostic tools and especially new treatments is scarce. That is why we don't have many treatment options in Peru or in South America. Uh, the diagnosis for um, leishmaniasis at initial stages can be very easy because there is a high load of parasites, but as time, pace, as time passes and the lesions become chronic, there is a strong inflammatory reaction and a mastigotes may be very difficult to be observed in the microscope. So PCR and culture may be needed for in, the, in those cases. Uh, here's another case of just uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis. Um, this is a, um, a worker who works in the Camesia gas project in the southern part of the Peruvian jungle. He developed a chronic painless ulcer in the ear 
in a nodular ulcerated painless um, adenopathy in the retroauricular lymph nodes. She responded well to IV antimonials. This is the actual smear. As you can see, there's a small amastic out here. You can see the small dot, the kinetoplast and the nucleus. So this is the, um, this is the a gem sustain where you can see some uh, Alismania mastic out. Oh, Leishmania um, tends to, to infect the more distal, cooler parts of the, um, of the human body, ear lobes, um, the, the extremities, it, it, sometimes the face, but it's mainly in the distal, more cool areas of the, on the, of the, um, of the human body. This is an, another case. I, I actually didn't, 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 did not treat it. This is courtesy of my former intern, Dr. Chelsea Vasquez, who is now an, uh, an intensive care specialist. Um, this is a young, recently diagnosed uh, male patient with HIV who has had an ulcer in his elbow. This is, you can see it here. Uh, it has some crusts, so there is a um, suspicion of bacterial su super infection. Um, he received IV antimonials for seven days, and then antiretroviral therapy was initiated. And uh, in, as you can see in this picture, some of the lesions, the, the plague got a little bigger, right? it got bigger. So what happened, he developed a cutaneous leishmaniasis, immune reconstitution, inflammatory syndrome, or iris, which resolved spontaneously, and the patient had a good outcome. So basically, leishmaniasis cases are treated as out outpatients in primary care centers, except for those with laryngeal involvement, those who are immune suppressed, or pediatric population. For cutaneous and mucocutaneous leishmaniasis, we have two main options, main treatment options, which are IV antimonials, which are given between 20 to 30 days. We prefer more days, the 30 days, um, the 30 day regime for, mu for mucosal leishmaniasis and 20 days can be used for cutaneous leishmaniasis. Um, adverse effects are common. There's a high rate of adverse effects. Most of them are mild to moderate like nausea, hyperexia, myalgia, arthralgia. Uh, it's very rare to see a patient that is receiving IV antimonials and it's not hyperexic. I mean that he has a good appetite. Mm. You can also have elevated pancreatic enzymes. Um, sometimes even can even lead to chemical pancreatitis. You can have elevated liver enzymes and ST wave changes in the AKG, EKG. The other treatment option is IV amphotericin B. Mostly we use the, the, the oxycolator amphotericin B. Um, of course, there's also metaphosin, but it's not widely available. Um, in the first case, we used um, IV antimonials because he already received IV antimonials in the last episode, as you can remember. We planned on using amphotericin B, the oxycholate amphotericin B, but uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, it was not available. That situation in our hospital is very rare, I must say that. But we usually have the, the medication, but it was during the COVID-19 pandemic in one, of the, in one of the worst moments. So we had a, sort, a shortage of all kinds of drugs. Um, well, this patient developed uh, pancreatitis due to the IV antimonials, uh, the patient in the first case. So we had to have him in the hospital for almost 60 days because we have to stop the medication until pancreatitis got better. Um, there were several locations and we have to stop the medication, wait for the pain and, and pancreatic enzymes to, to, be, to, to become normalized and then restart the treatment. Uh, that was uh, an unusual case. Uh, 
as I said, the second line uh, of therapy is amphotericin B deoxycholate. Amphotericin liposomal, uh, liposomal amphotericin B is not available for leishmaniasis in Peru, at least in public hospitals. Uh, you know the adverse effects of Ampho B are well known to you, like elevation on creatinine, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, and anemia. So, for our second case, um, we have, um, the date is March, 2017. Mark, mark that in your, in your head. Uh, the date is March, 2017. This is a 25 year old male, Pura, which is a Northern coastal city located in the, in the, in the Peruvian coast. I have highlighted three cities. This is a uh, Tumbes, Pura and, and Chiclayo, which were, where, uh, where um, this disease is very common. Um, he came with um, five days of fever associated with um, myalgia, arthralgia, and a headache. Uh, he had a diffuse truncal rush that has appeared. And at the moment when I, I saw him, uh, the fever had stopped. So this is the city of Pura. Note the rivers that cross the uh, come across the city. Um, these are some beaches in the <laughs> there are beautiful beaches in the um, coastal region of Pura, but this is the city of Pura. So, what are your thoughts? Aha! Uh -huh. Anybody? So, um, so this is a patient who comes with fever with a headache too? Five days of fever, uh -huh. myalgia, arthralgia, and a headache. When he comes to the, the consult, now the, the fever has disappeared maybe at the day before, and he has a diffuse truncal rash. Fever, headache, rash, uh, living in a coast and a river, close to a river. Yeah. Well, anybody? Nobody. Okay. I, I will continue, okay? So the diagnosis, of course, is dengue virus infection. Um, Dengue virus infection usually occurs in an endemic fashion in Peru, in tropical and subtropical areas, mainly in the jungle and coastal areas. Infections, infections occur year long, but outbreaks usually occur after rainy seasons. From time to time, we can have large epidemics like the one in the summer of 2017, which triggered a national emergency due to a meteorological phenomenon called the Niño Costero, which produced an elevation of the temperature of the sea near the coast of Northern Peru and Ecuador, which caused heavy raining, monsoon-like raining and flooding and mudslides. In the 2017 um, dengue epidemic, we had, there were about 17,000 cases of dengue, reported cases of dengue actually, but because underreported is very common in these cases. 17 of them had warning signs, 0.9% uh, had severe dengue, and we had uh, a 0.2% mortality with 37 reported deaths. And uh, the differential diagnosis in these cases is uh, actually other febrile illnesses like malaria, chikungunya, Zika, leptospirosis, uh, bacterial sepsis, influenza, Influenza, of course, now COVID-19 and yellow fever. Uh, one might think malaria, but actually malaria is very rare in the city of Pura. And yellow fever actually is very rare in Peru and it's located in small pockets in, in, the, um, in the central jungle of Peru. In that time in 2017, March, because of the floodings, uh, we had to 
think in, in, an, in other arboviruses. Of course, Zika was not that widespread as it is, as it is now. And chikungunya, there were not a, there weren't a lot of cases of chikungunya, but we have to know this clinical difference. Um, dengue is usually produces a high fever and is the only of three of these three are viral diseases that can produce shock. Zika uh, has a mild fever. It's a, a relatively benign uh, disease. It produces an early rash and conjunctivitis. And of course, chikungunya produces more articular involvement with acute oligoarthralgia and sometimes arthritis, which can be very disabling because of the pain. I'm sorry this slide is in Spanish, but I wanted to show you how the cases peaked after the, the heavy rainings in January. Um, so that gives usually the um, mosquito-borne epidemics like arbovirosis and malaria usually come after the heavy rainings, like it, this happened in March and April of 2017. I went to Pura as a volunteer to treat of one of, to treat these patients. Um, so this is the patient. This is the typical dengue rash, which we call it um, white islands in a red sea. As you can see, there are um, there is a basically a centrifugal macular rash that can be very pruritic. It usually appears after the defervescence. Um, this white uh, aisles or, or white patches are actually parts of um, normal skin and the red skin is the affected skin. See, you can see it here more clearly. The small patches of healthy skin surrounded by the, by the rash. Of course, in the clinical examination, uh, the rash can use it for the, the you can use it for the diagnosis, but the, the clinical examination, you have to uh, look at the skin and look for signs of bleeding like petechiae, echemosis, or signs of mucosal bleeding. So basically in the diagnosis of dengue, in these cases, um, we should think about dengue in any febrile patient who comes from an endemic area of dengue and it should be managed as dengue until proven otherwise. Same, uh, same as malaria, I think. Um, in epidemic or outbreak situations, a clinical di diagnosis may be enough if there are no warning signs to make the diagnosis of dengue. Uh, the diagnostic tools should be used according to the time after symptom onset. With less than seven days, the viremia can be detected by PCR or NS1 antigenemia. Those are the, the do two tests that must be used with seven days of uh, less than seven days since the onset of symptoms. And after seven days, we can use uh, the antibodies, mainly IgM or IgG. Uh, in cases of reinfection, IgG can be a, a lot higher than IgM. Uh, so that is uh, a teaching point that you you must have to you must have in your mind. These are these rapid tests, NSN, NS1, IgM, IgG, comma, rapid tests. Um, this is a negative uh, test. This is an IgM positive, uh, may, IgM positive patient. This is an IgG patient with, with fever. So this is a case of uh, reinfection, which is fairly common in those areas. Uh, Dengue can produce all types of rash. This is a popular pruritic rash, uh, not, not the typical rash of dengue. In this um, uh, slide, we can see a case of uh, hematuria, uh, blood in the urine with, with a blood clot in a patient who had dengue and, uh, and history of renal stones. Uh, this is the... Um, classic clinical course of dengue fever, which is divided in three phases, the febrile phase, the critical phase, and then the recovery on, or convalescence phase. Uh, the febrile phase usually lasts from three to seven days. 
And the most important um, thing here is obviously an elevated temperature and other symptoms like myalgia. The threatening issues here are mainly dehydration. As you can see, there's a high level of viremia and normally no changes in the CBC. In the critical phase, which usually lasts for 48 hours after their defervescence, that is the moment where, where complications usually occur. Uh, complications are mainly shock, bleeding, and organic impairment. Um, this is the moment where hemoconcentration can be shown in the CBC and uh, the decrease of platelets uh, is, uh, is, uh, occurs. Uh, shock in dengue mainly occurs due to fluid extravasation or third spacing, third spacing, not, it, not so much for bleeding. It's mo mostly due to fluid extravasation or third spacing. Of course, severe bleeding can occur, but it's not the main uh, cause of, uh, of hypovolemic shock. Um, well, in the recovery of convalescent phase, which is the last phase when this is when the CBC abnormalities become, begin to improve. There's usually reabsorption of fluids. And in cases, um, in some cases, the complication can, can be that we can see is fluid overload caused by aggressive IV hydration. In some patients, um, a sense of malaise and fatigue after the episode of dengue can last for several weeks as a post-viral syndrome. Well, this is the 2009 World Health Organization dengue classification based on the severity of signs. Uh, basically, we have to learn to identify the warning signs of dengue, especially when, when treating patients during outbreaks or, um, or epidemics. Um, because they, these warning signs might be a red flag for potential fatal complications. So the warning signs are persistent abdominal pain or tenderness in the upper, upper abdomen, persistent vomiting, clinical fluid accumulation, such as evidence of ascites or pure effusion, mucosal bleeding, and a palpable level enlargement. In young kids and, and in elderly, you can see lethargy or less restlessness. In the laboratory signs, there's usually hemoconcentration with a decrease in platelet counts. Of course, severe dengue, uh, there's shock fluid accumulation with respiratory distress and end organ damage like hepatitis, pancreatitis, myocardial dysfunction, and uh, altered consciousness. So basically, uh, dengue management is based in a thorough clinical examination to try to identify warning signs and a close follow-up and monitoring. Those without warning, warning signs uh, should be managed as outpatients with oral hydration, antipyretics, and to avoid NSAIDs and aspirin because of the risk of, uh, of bleeding and watch for and, and to tell the patient that, uh, that he, to watch for the warning signs. If the patient has warning signs, which account for less than 20% of the cases, it must be managed as an inpatient with close monitoring, IV hydration, um, monitoring for fluid and electrolyte imbalances, imbalances, and transfusional therapy as needed, red blood cells, plasma, or platelets. And those with severe dengue should be managed in the ICU. This is an actual picture of the um, of hospital Rate where I went to during the I, during the dengue epidemic. Uh, you can see the mosquito nets. Uh, this is a, a way to prevent intrahospitalary transmission because there were lots of mosquitoes uh, in the hospital as well. So to prevent uh, febrile patients to transmit the disease to other patients. Okay. For the um, third case, we have a 30-year-old male who came from Lima. He felt a bite in his chest three days before the admission while sleeping in his bedroom. 
it was in the right part of the chest. Uh, um, the pain in the chest worsened and a purplish lesion appeared. He then complained of brown urine and some jaundice in his sclera, mainly in his eyes. Uh, he attended to the ER where he was admitted. At the second day of during hospitalization, he developed hematuria, hematuria, and uh, renal failure. Oh, this is the city of Lima. This was mainly an accident that occurred in the city. So your thoughts may be? So let's wait a few minutes. Um, the, uh, the audience doesn't have an option for microphones. So feel free to uh, type in your differential diagnosis. And let's just wait for a few minutes for the audience. Oh. Nobody. Uh, yeah. wait, uh, there is a hand. Hold on. Um, okay. Um, so um, from um, Marco Antonio Valdivieso, he thinks it's luxurism. Um, luxurism. Anybody else? Yeah, luxurism. <laughs> um, So uh, another um, uh, another uh, attendee, Dr. Moore, uh, thinks that arbovirus leptospirosis uh, should be uh, Chagas should be in the differential diagnosis. Anybody else? Okay, go ahead, Dr. Malpartida. Okay, as you wish. Uh, so basically, this is a visual diagnosis. <laughs> um, it's, um, it's a case of systemic or visceral hemolytic loxosalism, which is caused by uh, brown recluse spider bite. As you can see, this, there's a purplish plague uh, in the area where the patient was bit. This is the left, this is the right hemi, the right part of the thorax. And um, in uh, loxosalism, the, the, in the first two days, the lesions tend to be small and pale due to vasoconstriction. And then 48 to 70 hours later, a, a purplish plague like this one uh, appears. It's called the libidoid plague. These lesions can expand and become ulcerated in the next one to two weeks. Uh, you can see the, the blood in the urine caused by the, by the by hemolysis and the bleeding diathesis, the coagulopathy caused by the uh, spider venom. This is after three days um, uh, of treatment and receiving a dose of anti-serum. The patient improved his renal function and immaturia stopped. Um, and as you can see, the, the cutaneous lesion started to ulcerate in this part. So this is the most severe spectrum of lexosalism visceral hemolytic loxosalism with systemic symptoms, right? But most of the uh, cases of loxosalism are cutaneous, are only cutaneous. Um, they can be very painful. The lesion, as I said, can ulcerate. This is a, the, a patient that was beaten in his, in his house where he was looking for uh, clothes in his wardrobe. Besides the pain and the ulceration, you can have also compartment syndrome due to, due to severe edema. And sometimes there's a need for extensive surgery for degradation uh, of necrotic uh, tissue. 
and even reconstruction with uh, skin grafts or flaps. In this case, it wasn't needed. So this is the spider, Loxoceles laeta. Uh, Loxoceleism is caused by envenomation of a species of Loxoceles. Is, 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 this uh, spider is mainly a uh, is mainly located inside homes. It is related to poor housing and hygiene conditions. In Peru, the most common species, as I said, is Loxoceles laeta, which can measure between one to four centimeters long. The amount of venom that it can produce is proportional to the size of the spider and the severity is also related to the location of the bite. Chest and face bites uh, tend to be more severe. These are other arthropods that you can find in, in, in Peru and South America. This is the black widow or Latrodectus mactans. We can produce a neurotoxic syndrome. Accidents with this spider mainly occurs in rural areas or in the fields. Uh, this is another uh, arthropod, a scorpion. Scorpionism is rare. It's mainly produced by the Hatudoides species. It also produces a neurotoxic syndrome. In both of these cases for scorpionism and latrodactism, there are specific uh, anti-serums. This is another spider. This is called uh, Phoneutria. Phoneutria, we can, you also call it a banana spider. It, it, it doesn't produce um, severe or life-threatening complications, but it can produce severe urticariform skin reactions. So general management for um, loxoselism uh, is basically focused on pain management and early detection of systemic complications such as hemolysis and renal failure. Local complications such as compartment syndromes uh, have to be detected early, which may require a fasciotomy. And as I said, uh, uh, extensive, intensive tissue necrosis may need uh, uh, surgery for debridement and reconstruction. Now, for the specific management of um, loxoselism, in this case, we use loxoceles, anti loxoceles serum, which is in Peru is made of a, it's an equine serum. I mean, it's a horse serum made out of horses inoculated with loxoceles venom. In some parts of Latin America, such as Mexico, there are humanized serums. Um, the dose is mainly one to two vials IV. The serum must be administrated. Uh, closely by the, observed by the doctor uh, because infusion reaction and anaphylaxis may occur. There's also a late, um, there's also a risk to, the, to later on, a, a couple of weeks later, develop serum sickness because of, uh, because of the serum, uh, of the horse serum. Uh, antibiotics in this case are only used if secondary infection, uh, secondary infection is suspected. And here's an important thing. If, if this is only a case of cutaneous loxoselism and there is no systemic involvement and no hemolysis, Dapson can be used to stop the tissue necrosis. necrosis. In this case, Dapson is thought to act as a modulator of the neutrophil reaction. We have to check, of course, for metahemoglobinemia and G6PD deficiency. This, uh, uh, Enzyme deficiency is rare in our population. This test is not widely available. We have it on our center though, but it takes a few days to obtain a result. So we weight risk versus benefit in those cases. That is also true for primakin used in malaria for G6PD deficiency. So this is our fourth case. Um, we have a 43 year old female patient it comes from a small town in the Amazon basin, in the Amazon River in Loreto region. Uh, she had fevers and chills two weeks before being admitted. Three days after the onset of fever, a thick smear came back positive for Plasmodium vivax. She received seven days of primakin and chloroquine, but fever persisted. So she was transferred to the Loreto Regional Hospital in Iquitos via boat, uh, which is a most, it's like a 10 hour ride in boat, at least. 
uh, these two cases, the, the last two cases that I'll be, I'll be showing you were seen in, in the Loreto Regional Hospital. I would like to thank the, the doctors over there. So this is the community or, or pretty much uh, a community that usually um, a rural community in the Amazon River. As you can see, uh, these are the living conditions. So Anopheles mosquitoes um, usually thrive in this condition, you know? So your thoughts, I will help you. The diagnostic hypothesis are mainly focused on drug resistance, malaria, drug resistant malaria caused by plasmodium vivax. We must say that chloroquine resistance in Peru is low for plasmodium vivax. Uh, we can also think that the patient had unsupervised treatment, but um, in the case of malaria, the treatment is centralized by the, the, the public uh, health centers and the, the malaria treatment is a directly observed therapy. Or maybe it can be a concurrent infection which is not rare, such as leptospirosis, dengue, Zika, or chikungunya. So, so this is a patient who has a diagnosis, who has, who has fever, was diagnosed with plasmodium vivax, she received the treatment and she continues to have fever. That's why she was uh, referred to the tertiary care center in, in Iquitos. So from the audience- So uh, your thoughts? Yeah, from the audience, we have uh, Dr. Moore. Um, uh, the, uh, she thinks that the differential diagnosis should include leptospirosis, yellow fever. From Dr. Okay. Arboleda from Colombia. I'm glad you joined us, Dr. Arboleda. Um, she thinks that we should uh, think about malaria mixta or combination of different types of uh, malaria. Mixed malaria. Yes. Anybody else? Okay, go ahead, Dr. Malpartida. Yeah, maybe a confection malaria. Well, uh, leptospirosis can be a, a co-infection and co-infection of malaria and leptospirosis is not rare, but the threshold for giving antibiotics is low. Uh, but the patient was fairly stable to, to be a case of leptospirosis. Um, so uh, yellow fever, it's a, uh, it, it can go good, be a good differentiation, but if, if, if this patient had yellow fever for three weeks, uh, complications should have occurred and, and it's, a, it's a very severe uh, disease. And of course, in, in that part of Loreto, yellow fever is very rare. But it's, it's good to have that in the differential, of course. So in the first day of hospitalization, a thick smear was performed and banana-shaped gametocytes were seen. So who said the uh, mixed malaria? Yes, Dr. Arboleda from Colombia. <laughs> from Apartado, Colombia, Tropical Institute of Medicine. Okay. So the diagnosis, of course, is mixed malaria infection with plasmodium vivax and plasmodium falciparum. Uh, malaria in Peru is endemic. It's basically a disease from regions located near the Amazonian region. In 2032, there were 4,500 notified cases with less than five notified deaths. Um, most of the infections are caused by plasmodium vivax, 81%. Then comes uh, plasmodium falciparum with 19%. And there are some sporadic cases of plasmodium malaria. Although rare, mixed infections can be accounted between two to 7% of cases. Uh, the treatment for malaria in Peru is basically depending, depending on the species. Uh, for plasmodium vivax, a seven-day course of chloroquine and primaquine is given. 
uh, for Plasmodium falciparum, uh, a three-day course of oral artesunate and mefloquine is the main treatment option. For severe malaria, we use um, IV artesunate, which is a drug of choice until the patient sterilizes the, 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 the smears become negative and then an oral regime uh, uh, directed to the species found is, is given. In this case, the patient had a course short uh, IV artesunate treatment, a short course of IV artesunate treatment, and, and then she was discharged with a full oral course of artesunate and mefloquine, and she had a successful outcome. I think this is our last case. This is a 60-year-old woman from Iquitos, which is the biggest city in the Peruvian Amazon. She lives in the city. She has good living conditions. She had approximately six months of patchy plagues in the arms, face, earlobes, and in the trunk. These lesions sporadically produce pain, and um, there are no ulcers in these lesions. This is a case that I saw in the Loreto Regional Hospital. So this is Iquitos. Is the biggest city in the um, in the Amazon River. It is at 300,000 300, city, 300,000 inhabitant city. It is the main port in the Peruvian Amazon River. As I said before, uh, it is the largest city in the in the Amazonian region. In the picture of the left, we can see on the right. I'm sorry. The, the, um, Belen neighborhood or Bethlehem, uh, translated to English, the, the Belen neighborhood, um, which some people, um, which is located deep within the riverside. Some people unfortunately call it the, the poor Venetia. Um, so uh, our patient came from, uh, was a professional, she had good living conditions, didn't have any household contacts with the disease I'm going to show you next which is leprosy, multivacillary lepromatous leprosy. This is a picture of the patient. Um, as you can see, there are numerous plagues in the trunk, in the face. Some people may call it a leonine face, you know, which resembles a lion or a big feline. The diagnosis was made with multiple skin biopsies, which showed acid fast bacilli. Unfortunately, I don't have the pictures of the biopsies or the smears. Uh, this is basically the spectrum of leprosy, which is a really Joplin classification. There is a wide spectrum of the disease uh, between the tuberculous palsy bacillary lesions and the lepromatous uh, multivacillary lesions. This, um, Spectrum of the disease usually depends between a complex interaction between the host mycobacteria and the immune system. Uh, the, the cause of uh, leprosy is mycobacterium leprae. It, it does not grow in, in, in cultures. Uh, tuberculoid leprosy tends to produce a more severe nerve damage and is associated with type 1 uh, reactions. And the, the promatose or lepromatoid uh, leprosy uh, can cause usually more a bigger number of lesions, a larger number of lesions, and, and, and during treatment, erythema nodosum associated with uh, antimicrobial treatment can appear, also called a type two reaction. So in the clinical evaluation of patients with leprosy, it is very important to check for superficial nerve thickening. Here I am palpating the, um, the cubital nerve, trying to palpate it. You have to search for the enlargement of the cubital, peroneal, and temporal uh, nerves in, and temporal nerves. Um, it's very important to check for um, loss of sensation also in the, especially in, in the lower extremities. Um, peripheral, because peripheral neuropathy and development of ulcers is one of the most important and dreaded late complications of leprosy. Uh, these patients, when, when there's severe um, uh, peripheral nerve damage, 
uh, they can have um, severe ulcers and infections, much like uh, uh, diabetic neuropathy. Well, so the diagnosis um, is uh, since leprosy is rare and is almost eradicated from Peru, which a prevalence of less than 1,000 less than one case per 10,000 inhabitants, we need to have a high index of suspicion in patients with skin lesions and or loss of sensation. Of course, the, the best uh, diagnostic tool is a biopsy with histopathology, but we can see besides the, the, the AFB, we can see the, the type of, um, of immune reaction or inflammatory response that is caused in the skin. But... Um, uh, since pathologists and, and, lab and uh, pathology labs are not widely available, the presence of uh, AFB in a direct examination of a small incision in the earlobes or in the lesions uh, can be also be used for the diagnosis. Of course, you can also use PCR when, when you have, a, especially in positive acillary cases, when, when you have a, a compatible... Um, histopathology, but you cannot uh, detect or see the AFB, you can use a PCR to, for directed to mycobacterium lepri. Well, this is the patient after three months of treatment. Uh, as you can see, the, the plagues are, are thinner. Um, there's some um, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. It can also be caused due to the clofacimine or maybe both. Uh, they like, the patient luckily had a good outcome, no major peripheral neurological damage, so it was a success. I'm very happy for her. So the treatment in Peru is basically uh, based, based on the World Health Organization classification, which is very easy, easy to use. Um, for multivacillary leprosy in adults, the, we use a 12-month regime of three drugs with rifampin, clofacimin, and dapsone. And for postulate bacillary leprosy, we use a six-month regime of dapsone and rifampin. Um, these are blisters of, of, a, of a treatment for one month. Uh, these are designed to be given even in primary care centers. So there's a day and, and then the fixed combination. These are some pictures. These are not mine, of course. These are from Mendel, uh, of a classic type one reaction, which is an, in a reverse reaction. The, the lesions tend to tend to be tend to occur outside of the of the primary lesion. Most common in in, in the tuberculoid leprosy, and this is a case of erythema nodosum. Uh, Leprosum associated to to, um, to the treatment of multivacillary lepromatoid uh, leprosy. So I think this is it. Maybe you have some questions. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Malpartia. That was a great presentation of these uh, cases. So we have uh, some questions from early on. Um, and please feel free to type any other question you guys have. But from early on, we um, there is a question from the audience. Um, there, there, uh, what type of uh, dengue type of clinical presentations you see more uh, commonly in Peru? So as you know, there are three types of dengue, febrile illness, hemorrhagic, and shock type. Um, what's the one that you encounter more frequently in your practice? Oh, uh, by far the most common is uh, just the febrile uh, mild cases. Um, hemorrhagic uh, or uh, severe dengue is fairly rare. Um, most of the cases are, are, are managed as outpatients. And since, uh, since sporadic cases that, that come throughout the year, we don't have... Um, um, rapid tests, we, we send the test to a reference laboratory, to a central laboratory, and, and the results usually take for a couple of weeks. So the, 
the patient usually got better uh, before the diagnosis, uh, uh, a complete diagnosis is made. Great. The other question uh, from the audience uh, was how uh, difficult or, or easy and what's the price to get antimonium treatment? Um, not just for antimonium, but in general for um, other medications that you use for uh, leptospirosis, I'm sorry, for leprosy, lesmaniasis, and malaria, and who pays for that? Yeah, um, the treatment for um, malaria, leishmaniasis, leprosy, are all um, funded by the government. Those are all bought by the central government, by the health, by the Peruvian Ministry of Health. Um, so you don't have to pay for the medication. It is widely available. Um, the, the, the Peruvian state uh, secures its provision to the, to the health centers. Um, in the last three years, uh, in, in leishmaniasis, there has been a problem with, um, with the supply of treatments, but I think it's, it's getting better. And unfortunately, because the treatments for leishmaniasis, dengue, no, leishmaniasis, tuberculosis, and, and leprosy, of course, are, are, um, are centralized by the Peruvian Ministry of Health to other, um, to other hospitals like in the social security or in private centers, it's very difficult to, to obtain the, the medication and, and a lot of bureaucracy uh, stands between the patient and the medication. But with time, uh, um, the, patient, the, the medication comes to this patient. So basically the government pays for the medication and, and, is, uh, is, uh, and there are no major shortages of the medication for these diseases. Thank you. Um, the other question they had is, um, have, you ha have you seen an increased cases of, um, of uh, lesmaniasis, malaria, among others, since uh, people are traveling more to, um, you know, um, since COVID, uh, uh, you know, since uh, they allow people to travel and the restrictions are less? Well, um, I guess this is endemic. So it, it, regardless of if they travel. That's a very interesting question. Uh, when, when COVID-19 first uh, appeared in Peru, in the jungle, in the Peruvian Amazon region, there was one of the biggest um, dengue outbreaks in the century. <laughs> so during the COVID pandemic, there was also um, a dengue pandemic the dengue epidemic. Um, since dengue is um, it's an endemic uh, disease and it's mainly located within the cities, dengue cases, I don't think they, they got, they diminished during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, but I think they became very underreported. Um, and uh, as for malaria, I would say that that is the same case. Maybe we are seeing more of these cases in, of malaria and uh, dengue, but in uh, tourists, you know, you know, in travelers uh, or returning travelers, because tourism is, is increasing right now. Well, it was increasing until last week <laughs> be because of the political turmoil. But yes, because of tourism was, uh, was starting to reactivate more cases of, uh, of dengue or malaria were, were seen in returning travelers. Um, but it's, the, it's just maybe a, a return to the normality. Okay, that, that's basically it. Uh, one more question. Regarding uh, the malaria case, when you suspect relapsing um, plasmodium vivax due to, when do you suspect uh, relapsing vivax due to dormant state? And how will you uh, how will this present in terms of uh, frame severity, etc.? Ah, well, 
in, in Plasmodium vivax, um, as you can see, we, I, I think we have um, um, uh, colleagues from Colombia. The um, our regime is very short of seven days of, of primaquine. And like other countries, like uh, I, I think in Colombia, Venezuela, they have 14 or 21 days of, of primaquine. So the relapses of uh, Plasmodium vivax in Peru are usually due to um, a low dosage of primaquine. So in these cases, we retreat the patient with a longer course of primaquine. And, and we make sure that the treatment is directly supervised. And they do not usually tend to be more severe. And they are usually less severe, the reactivations and or the relapses, I mean. And what else? Uh, and that's it. Ah, and of course, as I said, uh, resistance to chloroquine and primaquine is, is fairly rare. It's very rare in plasmodium vivax. That's great. Next question. Um, so have you ever had, this is from Dr. Sandin, our uh, microbiology pathologist, uh, physician. Have you ever had a joint case of mucosal involvement by Lesmania and paracoxidioides? Um, together or you don't see paracoxy in Peru? Well, we, we, we see paracoxidoidomycosis in Peru. Yes, it is fairly common. Uh, 